come on board and I also have to make sure I don't go too far forward. Uh, my name is Chris Muller. I uh, have a background. I'm a restaurant uh, operator by vocation, but I'm an educator by profession. So I've been in the restaurant business for 55 years. I started when I was 15 at working at a Carvel ice cream store. I've owned two very successful failures. I had a restaurant on Cape Cod in 1980, and then I opened another restaurant in, in Maitland, Florida, and both of them had more customers than we could afford. Uh, it was, you know, we just didn't quite get the, the numbers right, uh, but people were waiting to get in on the days we had to close. So, uh, sometimes you learn more by your failure than you do by your success. But I also opened some successful places for other people. It uh, doesn't look like anybody here is old enough to remember Montana's, uh, which was on Dartmouth and Commonwealth. Uh, I was the opening general manager there. First year that we opened, it was named uh, Best uh, 100, Top 100 Bars in America by Esquire Magazine, the only one in Boston, first time ever. So I've, I've got some background, and I realized um, when I walked in, Martin Eddy's was there. I used to work for United Liquors for the Thai family. I was the first full-time wine manager for, for United Liquors back in 1982. So I've been doing this a long time. Um, and, and the good thing is that I've now come to the realization that I should be giving back. Uh, I've been doing that for a while, but I'd like to just share with you some, some ideas that we've, we've got about trends. All right? um, because it's a small crowd, uh, I'm very much willing to be interrupted at any time. If you've got something you'd like to ask about, don't be shy. Okay? Just put up your hand, I'll stop. I will repeat myself. There's an old saying that I'm not teaching if you're not learning. And if you're not understanding or you think something I said was you just like a clarification, just ask me to stop. Um, we're not in any hurry. There's nobody after me. The only thing you've got to do is get out of here by 3 o'clock because that's when they turn the lights off. So uh, let's, let's see if we can make this in enjoyable and, and fun at the same time. So one of the things we're talking about is this new reality. We just came through the worst time in, in restaurant history, but it's going to open up tremendous opportunities. Is it exactly the same as it was in 2019 or 2020 in terms of sales and everything else? Not in your life. Will it be? Absolutely. It will just be different, and we know that because we've been talking about it for three years now. Um, but the thing that's important on this slide is that way, way down in the bottom where I talk about the omni-channel that your restaurants are going to be in. We're going to talk about three basic ideas. I just, I wrote a book a few years ago in 2013 on the leader of managers. My specialty is chain restaurant management. I, I've uh, been talking about multi-unit managers and how you grow from one to two, from two to ten, from ten to twenty. I've worked with many of the, the largest companies, but also small companies, on how to get to that point. So I just had uh, released. This will be out on Amazon within the next week. Um, it's called The Leader of Managers. And the second edition is about the last 10 years, but especially about how the industry has changed in the last um, uh, three uh, years since COVID. Hey, Michael. Um, so. A quick, not even commercial, but um, I'm here with my executive director of a learning company we've started, and Alec Dalton is in the front. Uh, he can answer some questions too, but what's important about this is we ran a, um, uh, a seminar this past January in Miami uh, called The Leader of Managers. It's an international program. People were, came from as far away as, uh, as Indonesia. We had people from Europe. Uh, we're going to repeat it again in January of this coming year, January 24. It's based in Miami. I can't imagine anybody in the Massachusetts market who wouldn't want to be in Miami in January, uh, and especially because it's educational, so it's actually a taxable event. So if you're interested, we'll have pricing and things coming up in a few, uh, a few weeks. We've, what's happened, this new reality, we have two new kinds of customers. The demographics have split. We have these customers, well, I'm going to describe as the experience-driven customer, the people who return to the restaurant, right, and learned and seem to have forgotten how to use silverware while they were gone. Uh, we've we've got this whole generation of new operators and new new guests. 
The second demographic is the people who never leave their home. Everything comes to them. These are the convenience guests. And so um, what you've got is two kinds of customers in the post-COVID world. The, in the industry is in a point now of as much of a tectonic change as happened when I was young and we were, it was 1950s and fast food came into the marketplace. Prior to the 1954 explosion of McDonald's and, and um, Kentucky Fried Chicken and Burger King, there were only two categories for restaurants. There was full service and limited service. And both of them required service people to wait on you, experience-based. After fast food, when you started waiting on yourself, you still went to the restaurant. What's happened today is a completely new model for the industry. And, and I can't play this because it's not picking up, but pretend they're saying, I want it all, I want it now. Okay, so you heard the, the queen singing the song, okay? How much are you gonna pay for a good idea? What's gonna change the way you think, all right? And when you say, what is it gonna, gonna cost me? What's it gonna cost me not to change the way I think? How much does it cost me for a good idea, but how much do, do I, ha I lose because I don't embrace a new idea? Well, I've got three megatrends in this lecture that we'll get to, all very much related to each other. Uh, so the three are the convenience versus experience I just mentioned, who gives me the best data, how do I get smarter from the information that's available to me? And how do I survive with much higher food cost, less labor that also costs me more? How do I rethink my business model because it's not the same as it used to be? And one of the things we're going to talk about is that omni-channel. We are in a time of rapid but hardly noticeable change. Right? Things have changed dramatically. How many of you have a smartphone? Uh, how many of you have an iPhone? Okay. How many of you have a 16-year-old employee? Or a 16-year-old child? Any of you have kids that are 16? What's the, what's the connection between those things I just mentioned? What do you think? Well, we all know the kids want one of these. Rapid but hardly noticeable change. What's the day? When did this come out? A day that you should put in your mind for the rest of time. January 9th, 2007 was the day that Steve Jobs stood on stage and showed the first iPhone. January 9th, 2007. It just turned 16. You have children who are younger. You have employees who are older than the iPhone. If you have a 17-year-old employee, they, were, they are older than the iPhone. How much of your life as a business person has changed since January 9th, 2007? For one thing, we've changed the way we, our hands are shaped. Every one of us does this all the time. It's just how it is. In 2007, you might have lost your flip phone. Oh my God, way to go, I've left. Or oh, you clip. We love technology. But you don't lose your phone anymore, you misplace it. Oh, I left it in the bathroom when I was Tetrising, or I, I left it in the car, I gotta go back and get it. You can't live without it. In 2000, I gave a lecture in, in Hamburg, Germany, on the online restaurant. And I had a student at the Rosen College at the time who said, if you don't have a, re a website, you're not a, a restaurant of the future. In 2000, less than 1% of restaurants had websites. Rapid but hardly noticeable change. Think about just, oh, the good old days. How many of you can remember when your restaurant didn't need tap and go? You didn't have to have Apple Pay. You didn't have to have a QR menu code. Remember uh, QR menu codes, oh man. Or you, you didn't need to have a, uh, a, an app if you can afford it. Or you didn't have a third deli uh, party delivery company. The good old days, that was three years ago. 
Those things have only come into the market in the last three years. That is rapid but hardly noticeable change. It's just occurring. And one of the things that makes this especially important is here. Traditionally, remember I started by saying we used to have two categories, just full service and limited service. Over the last 50 years, we have been a supply side business model. We, we used all of those things on the right to categorize our restaurants. We used the four key ingredients of how much did it cost, how long did it take, how much was the, how good was the food and and basically how expensive was it because higher on that stage or lower on the stage told us what kind of customer we were expecting to come into our restaurant but we're not in a supply side world anymore it has changed because of covid what's happened is the consumer has flattened this we are no longer a vertical, we are now a horizontal business. And when I'm saying horizontal, they either go to the food or the food comes to them. And, and now because of delivery, 60% online, where we have changed is that we can compete in both places, but they are telling us what we are. They are deciding on the time. How long does it take for me to make the purchase decision? Is it an impulse buy? Do I want to get a pizza right now? Or is it something I'm planning to go out with my wife for my anniversary? How long in, in, and how much of the pricing is involved? In the delivery world, I can have sushi, pizza, and a steak at the same time from three different places. I've, I've disaggregated the purchase. But if I go to a restaurant like we did last night, we went for Italian food. She wanted pasta. All right? That was it. You have to go because that, that was the integrated model. We were not going to get sushi at the Italian restaurant. You're not going to get pizza at McDonald's. Okay? So think about this. Uh, the tectonic shift is we've gone from a model that was vertical to a model that is now horizontal. And what's expected of you as operators is you're going to have to figure a way to hybridize this, to create a new way of looking at this. You're gonna be wanting to be in that middle. We don't wanna all be delivery. We don't wanna all be in dine-in. We have to be both. And what's the focus of this? The consumer. That you're gonna have to manage the customer experience across this horizontal horizon, this horizontal landscape. And so you can see what we said is bringing the restaurant to the customer. You see lots of stuff here with purchase, with packaging, and the ways that you're gonna communicate to them. They have changed the way they look at you, and so we we have to accept that and change the way we look back at them. Part of it is the, the uh, entire idea of location, location, location. Right? When I left the restaurant business, we were arguing about here in Boston, could we get a place at $75 a square foot plus, 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 or was it going to be $100 or $125? In 2019, we were way rushing to get to $100 a square foot and another $400 or $500 in a build-out to be on the high street. I'm sure that the market is a little bit softer now. There's a lot of closed places. You can probably negotiate some deals, but it's still $50, $60 a square foot on the high street in the, in the best locations. But really, where is your location now? It's there. It's on your cell phone or it's on your, your iPad. It's a tiny, tiny one quarter inch piece of real estate. That's your brand image. We spent a lot of money in the past fighting about our brand image and our trade dress. I'm, an, I'm a federal expert witness in branding. To tell you the truth, this changes all the ru rules about what trade dress is. And why? How much per square foot are you paying for that? Well, if you want to write an app, it's $125,000 to $200,000, unless you do it yourself, and, but then you not, might not have all the gigs and every, the bells and whistles. 
but think of what, how much time. There was just a seminar here before me on social media, right? Everybody wants to be in social media. The room was packed. Why? They want to learn about this. So not only do we have customers that are now horizontal in our offerings, but they're also getting information in a different way. They are not walking by our restaurants like they used to. They're not driving to the restaurant. They are looking for this. I did an entire 10-year study on restaurant failure in the 19, uh, from 1960 to 1970 using the yellow pages as my data set in three cities, Syracuse, Columbus, and Phoenix. We could still get the yellow pages. And in those days, if you had a restaurant, you had to be in the yellow pages. They came out once a year, typically in April, up here in New England. So you paid in advance to be listed in the yellow pages. How many of you pay to be in the yellow pages anymore? Do you even know what the yellow pages are? You know, <laughs> the phone book's gone. We use it as a doorstop when we get really pissed because there's nine of them in the lobby of the apartment building. So, you know, who even shows up to do those? This is how we find people. What did we do to look for an Italian restaurant last night over in the North End? We went to Google and we went to the maps and, and my wife didn't want to walk more than 10 minutes so we looked for places that were four or five minutes to walk to. Who makes a restaurant decision on how long it takes to walk to them? And then the second thing was, how much is it going to cost? Well, everything costs 20 to $30 now in every restaurant in the North End. So, oh, is it 21 or is it 25 And how long is it going to take us to get back? Did, you know, there were menus outside. Did we look at them? No, we looked at them before we even got there. Okay. So, this is a very dense slide, but just pick out any one of them and sort of say to yourself, what, it, what is it that I've got here? Oh, on the convenience side, we have content consuming. What, what does that mean? The, the, the customer is taking content from us. On the experience side, it's content creating. They are taking selfies. They are taking Instagram pictures. They are posting their experiences online. They are actually coming to the restaurant and adding content. Where when they're a convenience customer, they are just taking it from you. If you look at this whole line, big data sharing versus small data personalization, the, the entire business model has changed. And when it's changed, it means that we are now in a new world. A restaurant can, be, can still be one thing, but it's going to have to be everything. The omni-channel. And what we need to, to do is, the, the folks at McDonald's said the coming restaurants for them were going to be involved in three Ds. drive through delivery, and digital. And to that I'd add one more, dine-in. Four different Ds for us to be involved in. We're gonna dine in like traditional restaurants. Still, more than 60% of restaurant sales happen in restaurants. And, and it's, it's not gonna get much lower than that. We have drive-through. Drive-through customers still going to the restaurant. It's an experience base. How good is the drive-through? You look at Chick-fil-A, went to double drive-throughs and then put people standing out in the in the rain to take your order. Why do we, you know, why is it an average Chick-fil-A doing six and a half million dollars today? Because they thought about what the customer needed when they came to the restaurant. And they're not even open on Sundays. Six days a week, they're doing a million dollars a day in the typical Chick-fil-A. So, delivery, development, diffusion of day parts. Now, we just we were in Tampa, we ate at a place called the Oxford Exchange. It's got $27 uh, breakfast items. It's only open from 8 until 3. It doesn't have any dinner. You know what they do at night? They cater. They do weddings. They do businesses. But there's no dinner service. Okay? Everything is different in the way that they look at the business model. Just within the last few months, there's, these two reports have come out. One is about, from Bloomberg, was last week, is about Darden and Olive Garden. And why did they say Olive Garden is up 8.5% over last year in in-house in dining? And they say it's variety, and they say it's uh, a good value, and they have a digital imprint in the restaurant that makes it frictionless to order and to pay. They've gotten it right and their sales are, are booming. They talk about Sweetgreen, before COVID, on fire, 
has lost you know, half its market value, but is coming back. Well, what's going to happen with Sweetgreen? Because there's nobody in the offices anymore, their, their business model changed. But they're suddenly going, Sweetgreen is now doing 60% of its orders online. Twice as many as, as uh, Chipotle. 60% of the people who bought, buy from Sweetgreen order it online and just pick it up at the store. Right? Not delivery, online ordering. Those are things that we have, did not have to deal with three years ago. We've known that there's been these, comp these incredible branded items in the supermarket. National chains, okay? You can't compete with, with P.F. Chang's and, and a Chinese you know, restaurant. I'm going to show you a picture. This is a small homegrown chain in Central Florida called Tijuana Flats. Uh, Tijuana Flats is a aggressive um, taco Mexican kind of place, in your face place. Since the day they've opened, they've had a hot sauce bar. Go over and help yourself. So many people like it. You notice what it says there? Try it, like it, buy it. This small little chain, regional, packages its own bottled sauces and puts them on the wall by the cash register. It, it, last time I heard it was about 15% of their revenue model. Selling bottles of their own sauce, but they've got the tasting bar there. If you go online to Tijuana Flats, it looks like that on their website. There's the sauces, a description, they're $6.99 a bottle. They are in the sauce business, along with everything else. What are they doing? Omnichannel. Taking the restaurant and putting it in your refrigerator. You have to now start to think about the entire package of what we're doing. Where will revenue come from going forward? It will come from the traditional places such as dine-in, but it's going to be also now traditional delivery. We still haven't gotten that right. Drive-through and curbside, digital brand, um, you know, the ghost kitchens, doing stuff with selling second brands out of your same kitchen if you have extra capacity, and merchandise, selling your own product. The sad part about that is where do, what do we do about this? It's gonna add expenses. We can't do this for free. We have to have creative design. Think of what's happening now. You've gotta figure out a way to have a second kitchen line for your delivery. It killed Pizza Hut. Most of you remember Pizza Hut having red roof ends. They were the number one by, by a thousand percent compared to number two national pizza chains. And then Domino's came by with 30 minutes of free. Pizza Hut with 3,000 red roof ends in the United States says, we can do that. It's a couple of pimply faced kids with a car, 16 year olds. We can deliver pizza, we've got all these restaurants. Well, what they figured out, or came to realize, is if you've got a family of four sitting in the restaurant ordering a cheese pizza, and you've got a 16-year-old in the kitchen banging on the window because he has to get that pizza to somebody in 30 minutes or it's free, who gets the pizza first? The drive through And what happened to the in-house pizza huts? People stopped going. Why should we go to this place that treats us like second-class citizens? How many of you have gone to one of your favorite casual theme restaurants and seen the entire row next to the front door, not for the handicap parking, but for drive-through pickup curbside? When I, the first time I saw that in an outback I, in Winter Springs, I couldn't believe it. I was so annoyed that I have to park across the parking lot and the people who aren't even going to eat in the restaurant get to have the spot next to the front door. What are they telling me? You don't matter. We don't need you anymore. Okay? We have to think about the way we design restaurants. I, now you're seeing it more and more. Uh, we were just in a, um, a, a we, we looked at a, I think it was a Friday. The delivery windows, they move the back door. You don't, go, you don't see the parking lot. Go in the back where the trash is. Pick up in the back door. We'll just put a window in it. Okay? Keep the good spots for the good customers. Change the design. You're going to have to have creative takeout windows, you're going to have to have creative pickup windows, and probably two completely different cooking lines. One for de delivery takeout, one for something else. You're going to have to change your packaging, you're going to have to change the, the, the labor skills. We've got an entirely new kind of business model. How many of you have a full-time social media manager? You're going to need one. 
you know, just like we needed to change the, to more service management, you're going to need somebody that does nothing but work on your social media. You just heard it here before. And the research and development, your chef has to spend time thinking about how you're going to package some of your best products. You need to have a presence at home. It took Chick-fil-A until about two years ago to figure that out. Now what do you get? You can go buy Chick-fil-A sauce in the supermarket. It was, you know, and it was, it's a white plain bottle, but they, they knew they had to be in the marketplace. Right? So what do we see? Digital equals data, loyalty equals data. And what I mean by this is that a customer's relationship to you in this new horizontal environment isn't the way they used to talk about you in the past. Now it's mobile ordering, it's payment options on, you know, how do I pay for this without having cash in my pocket? How do I, uh, should I deliver a takeout? I'm a takeout guy. We have a pizza place down in Onset um, called Mark Anthony's. I, you know, and Mark Anthony's amazing frictionless ordering system. If you've never ordered from Mark Anthony's, you dial the phone, they pick it up, and the guy, Mark, is gruff. He's a, he's a nasty guy on the phone. He says this, pick up or delivery. He doesn't answer the phone by Mark, you know, Mark Anthony. Pick up or delivery. Pick up. Order. Large sausage pie. Name. Chris. See you in 15. And he hangs up. That's the entire ordering process at Mark Anthony's. Pick up a delivery, order, name. No pricing, no can you hold, no phone number, I don't care about it. Come and get your damn pizza. That's frictionless delivery. Right? And the place is mobbed 364 days a year. Social media activity, menu purchasing history, all this stuff is things we're going to have to know. Contact sharing, rewards usage, we're going to have to change the way we talk about our relationship to the customer. They expect some kind of reward for being your customer. We're staying at the Marriott on points. Right? I've, I'm choosing how I'm going to make my next trip to Florida because should I go on American or JetBlue? Well, I just figured out, coming back here from Tampa, that JetBlue now gives me my gold status with American. I got on the plane first. I was in D. I went from D to priority. I expect that. How do we build that loyalty? It used to be that we knew their names. The kiosk that we see in all the fast food businesses, it's not the kiosk, it's knowing about the person who's using it, tracking the data of the customer. That's basically just a giant cell phone. When you go to the kiosk in McDonald's, it's just a giant iPhone. You pump, 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 and they get asked, how many times have you been asked for your, your, um, your um, email account or your phone number? Why? Because they wonder who you are. They're tracking it. Okay, we've sort of gotten over that. But it's not about the kiosk, it's about who, who's using it. This is the new Chipotle design of a dining roomless Chipotle. It's all high tech, order online, go and pick your pizza up. But what is it really about? That little sign over on the side. Haven't ordered yet? T load our app. They don't want just your order, they want you on the app so they have knowledge of what you're doing. That's, the, that's where you start to change the, the information. Data. Digital, data, loyalty. Those are the things that are going to be important to you going forward. Years ago, we created this as a growth model. It's the cornerstone for the for the for the restaurant business. Okay, but what's uh, for for growing? It's the five phases of of growing your, yourself as a manager. What we're, I'm suggesting is each of these five areas has also changed: operations, facilities planning, finances, marketing, and human resources. In the last three years, each of them has changed the, the way we have to look at the business to grow. And so what I'm suggesting here is, you've, you know this picture. I'm going to guess most of you watch the bear. Okay? We all looked at the bear and said, I know that guy. I am that guy. I've been there, done that. You know? But the operations have changed, and the, and the bear is a good example of how. What's changed, we've, we've now got all of this stuff. What happens to the bear when he, he opens the restaurant? They get inundated with what? online orders they go they go under right he gets completely flooded with orders and can't handle his own business
Why, why? It wasn't because people were coming into the restaurant. It was technology. Technology changed the way the bear had to do business. Um, facilities planning. I'm guessing most of you have seen this as well. Um, this is the menu. And I, I put this picture up because if you look at the first things on this list of how facilities have changed, what do we have to care about? Guaranteeing customer safety. Well, I don't know if he did that. How about uh, employee health? Well, maybe not there either. Um, limits on seating capacity. Well, yeah, yeah, that too. You know, the the, um, the chef in in the menu basically was uh, cutting edge in his planning on how to use these facilities. Um, but finance has changed. I say, uh, you know, I'm sure most of you have at least talked to the people at Toast. Uh, I'm not, this is not an advertisement for Toast, it happens to be a great graphic because Toast is in all of these spaces. Uh, you need to be gathering information and making use of it. I'm old enough to remember when we went from um, old style uh, national cash registers to the first technology ones. When I worked at the Quincy Market in 1978, we brought in a Sweda machine and the Sweda machines were guaranteed to jam every night. So in Thompson's Chowder House, we finally figured out that one of the giant long cocktail forks that we had at the raw bar was perfect for fishing out the, the paper tape every night because it would just jam up and the machine had died. Do, 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 do. And the thing was, you know, this big. Right? And it, remember when you had to X out or Z out the machines at the end of the night? And what did you do? You'd leave at the, as a manager at the end of the night, you'd push the X and the Z key, and you'd come in the next morning, and there'd be a roll of white paper all the way out to here with all of the data you had on it. And what would we do? We'd take and we roll it back up, put a date on the outside, put a rubber band around it, and put it on the shelf. We were getting all this information that was absolutely unusable because it just was too much to use. Now you can get everything in a dashboard. You can get everything in instantaneous information. We have to train ourselves to be able to use it. Right? And, and, so, and financing is going to change dramatically because of that. The marketing, you just saw all of this, this stuff. Uh, a social media campaign was just you know, on stage. That's a picture, you, some of you might recognize it as Evans. Evans is one of the most Instagrammable uh, restaurants on the entire East Coast. Why? The design, the lifestyle, the packaging, people want to have their pictures there. We've known on Instagram, the number one th factor for an Instagram picture for years was the color pink. If you made your restaurant pink, people took pictures of it. Okay? For whatever reason. Pink drove them. You need to be in that space. What is Instagramming doing for us? It's bringing the restaurant to the customer and, and changing that conversation. It's the new horizontal. And of course, human resource management, uh, God knows how we're, anybody's managing this, but think of the things that you're supposed to be doing now in terms of career development. Good for me in my new in my new world of training and development people, so that we are we are creating a non-credit credential system. People can come to school at their own rate and get credentials in the topics they want, so that you can sponsor them to get smarter, because all of your employees want to get smarter. So the three mega trends: convenience versus experience. No more vertical all about horizontal how are you going to compete with the other competitive clusters that you're in who gives me the best data how do i start to use the data that's available to me and make make better decisions and how do i save on labor costs we start to look at the the employees that we have for retention for development and for partnership how do we create a new reason for them to stay and to grow with us. Even if we're a single unit, there's still opportunities for job enrichment. Enrichment and encouragement, not empowerment. So, last slide. Start a conversation. Let me hear what you, if there's something you, you heard you'd like to talk about. I'm, I'm basically a very open guy. Let me know what you need. How'd I do on time? That's why I, I just, yeah, I just want. This one. Can you put the handhelds on? Yeah. Yeah. It's loud, but not, not loud. There we go.
Thanks for sitting down. He, he was standing in the back. Thank you. You were standing in the back. You came all the way down. That's a good. That was an affirmation. Thank you. Hey, Chris, I, I have a question for you. So um, as you're talking about kind of like quality, convenience, cost being really like high level needs for the growing consumer, you know, one of the other ones we've noticed a lot has been the idea of customizability. And certain software programs like you're talking about, Radiant has uh, consumer recognition AI technology built into their boards where it looks at your demographic, age, sex, and then it curates a menu based on what it thinks you would like based on their sales. So with insane things like that going on right now, what have you seen as far as customizability within restaurants that may push that to the next level or are just creative or unique or ideas that you think have the power to spread? I, what I would say, I'm going to personalize this, all right? When I turned 60, I found out that I was lactose intolerant. I always was. I just didn't know it, you know? So I used to eat a lot of Carvel ice cream and I'd get really, really sick. Well, once I found that out, I've, the first thing you do is you buy these pills, but I never have them with me. So what have I done? I've learned to change my ordering behavior. Uh, so we went to an Italian restaurant last night. I had salt and bocca, and I asked them not to put the cheese melt on top. I was customizing it, all right? But what I'm amazed about, and I've, I've actually yelled at Ron Shake from Panera Bread about this. I said, why do you have all this crap milk? The oat milk and, you know, oat milk is just basically, they take the oatmeal and whatever's left it, but, you know, at the end of the day, they just put it in a, in a bottle. But all these non-milk products, about 20% of the, of the dining public is lactose intolerant. 20%. Well, why don't we customize for that? Instead of just, you know, we've got all these, these allergen things, and Ming is, was a leader in, in this, food allergies. But we can customize a lot better and not make the kitchen suffer. We don't have to make them, you know, make everything the same. But even before, way before uh, COVID, it was estimated that about eight out of 10 orders in any restaurant was customized. Uh, we went to dinner at the old O'Leary's, used to be on, on um, uh, Beacon Street in St. Mary's. And we were the, some people, as a matter of fact, the same people I'm going to dinner with tonight. And she looked and they had this Tuesday burger. And the Tuesday burger was like barbecue sauce and provolone and bacon. And that sounds so good. Wait, waitress came over and said, can I have the Tuesday burger? She said, sure. She said, oh, but can I make a substitution? She said, yes. She said, well, I don't want the bun. I don't want the barbecue sauce. I don't want the bacon. Can you give me avocado and can you give me raw onion? And I just looked at her and said, Vanessa, what are you talking about? That's not the Tuesday burger. That's the Vanessa burger. There's nothing other than the burger that's the same. But that's the mindset most people have come into. We need to be more uh, uh, aware that first off, when customers come into the restaurant, they're going to ask for something different. So how do we customize it for them? Well, we just, it, it, back in the 80s, we talked about postponed differentiation. How close to the customer can you get before you have to change something? Think of um, the walk line in a Chinese restaurant. Basically, they'll create 30 different items but they've got everything sitting in front of them. Why? All the labor is stored in the, the, the wok food you know, that they put in and then customize different sauces. Regular restaurants haven't adapted that mindset that it, we can customize to anything you want as long as we're set up for it. Pizzas. Pizzas are all customized. You start with the, the, the dough and now it's not even the same. And then we just take whatever you want and ask it. But you look at it, how do they get it 30 minutes or free? It's because it's customized and on order. What we need to do is rethink our order. It doesn't have to be an AI. I think that's kind of scary when a customer tells me what I'm, what I'm eating. You know, it's one thing when, when you, you know, if you call Domino's and they say, oh, I, so you like, you know, pepperoni on your pizza. I order that same sausage pie from Mark Anthony's every time. Does he care? Couldn't give it a crap. But I know that's all I order it for. So customizing it for me, means make me feel like I'm in control, but you are actually the ones who are controlling the customer choice, just like every waiter I've ever did. I'm gonna tell you what you're gonna have for dinner tonight. Um, so I think, I think there's many, many ways to make something appear completely customized, the customer of one, the product of one, because we're already doing it. Instead of saying, I'm not gonna do that, just stop and say, hey, go, you know, go in the kitchen and ask the chef, 
Tonight, how many orders did you have to change? Take out the garlic, leave off the onion, you know, uh, can I have a different sauce? Can I have the sauce on the side? Anybody who says I want the sauce on the side, just customize their entire man menu. We already do it. We just don't, we don't give ourselves enough credit for how smart we are. Uh, we, we think we're a dumb business. We're in the software development business. And we're a very high-tech business. And, and what I mean by that is if somebody says to you, I don't know how you can be in the restaurant business, it's so hard. They could, they could be saying, I don't know how you're a uh, rocket scientist or you're, you're, you're a brain surgeon. What they're saying is, I don't understand your technology. I don't understand what you do. And the difference between Olive Garden and Red Lobster isn't the equipment as much as Trimark would like you to think it is. They've got the same equipment, they've got the same Tito's vodka, they've got the same Coca-Cola, probably the same, the same pasta. What's different is the software, the operating systems. So take your software, go back and, and you know, tweak it so that instead of them saying, why don't you customize it, say, we'll make it any way you want. The restaurant I had in Florida had 40 wines on the list. Every one was available by their class. Customize? Yeah, come in, we're supposed to be selling wine. Why not have every wine on the glass? I don't, you know, set a price. $25 a glass, $50 a glass, who cares? Do we have any more questions? <laughs> <laughs> I hope so, because I gave you a long answer to a very short question. Hi, Michael. What's going on, Chris? So? I have a question for you. In modern day, as you said it before, that, that a lot of these restaurants, like whether it's a Chipotle or a Starbucks or anything like that, people continuously go back to these restaurants for the convenience factor, regardless of the hospitality they're getting. So the, the, the two questions I have is, the first one is, do you believe that hospitality and personality in general has taken us a, a back seat to convenience? Is convenience more important than hospitality these days due to those factors? And two, um, with restaurants becoming, like a sit-down restaurant being more of an event, how can a smaller business combat uh, convenience on the weekdays versus the weekends when people have actually the time to go out to dinner? Yeah, and so I think, uh um, two things. Will Giadera would say absolutely not. Radical hospitality is the con is what we're doing. If you've read his book, I think the difference is that the more hospitality you put into the convenience, the more competitive your business is going to be. Because basically, the delivery, as I said, the difference between a Five Guys hamburger and a steak from Capital uh, Capital Grill, once you get it home, is marginal. They, you know, they they're basically cold. The stuff is, is inedible, and you just say to yourself, why did I just spend $60 for a steak when I could have had a, a you know, $10 hamburger and I would have been just as happy? The difference is the way it gets packaged, the way it's delivered, the extra added value. We ordered once for, during early parts of COVID from Capitol Grill, went down and got it, and brought it back, it was our anniversary, it was May, so it was one of the few things we could do. We, and I brought it home, and I opened up the bag, and I was just touched. There was little things in the bed. The packages were nice. They, there was a ribbon around the dessert. There was a higher level of uh, cutlery. There was a, they gave us a free appetizer of some, of just a small, like, uh, you know, some sort of dip. But just uh, what they, in New Orleans, they call them a Latin app, that extra special gift, or we, you know, the amuse boucher. Add hospitality to the convenience, and you're bringing the restaurant into the, into the, the package, don't just allow it to be Uber Eats brings this to us, uh, because that's how you differentiate yourself from the guy next door. How do you do that in the, in the uh, to get people front, back into the restaurants in the weekends, uh, in the weekdays? I think it's the same problem as the golf courses. Nobody wants to spend four and a half hours playing golf on the weekends. Suppose you could just go and play a short hour of golf just for the exercise. All right. Think of how golf courses could, could actually be more attractive to people who are on a busy schedule if you could go play golf for 15 bucks. You know, we, we passed a climbing wall uh, exercise place over on, on Thatcher Street. Huh. You gotta be an insane person to spend three hours going to a climbing wall because you get hot and sweaty. But how do we change it? We, we streamline the stuff have, for, you, for your restaurant in particular. I think you want to look at what the neighbors want and how can you get them in and out. Why do we have seats at the bar? The seats at the bar are the perception that it's going to be faster. It's going to be easier. I don't have to do anything else. First come, first serve. Put a price fix menu. You know, back 100 years ago, we had blue plate specials and plat de jours. Two, two meat, uh, meat and two, 
two sides all at once. When you fly internationally, how many of you have flown internationally when they say you can, you can have everything at once in advance and go to sleep? Right? Why are we still ordering pot de jours and, and you know, one side? Order it now, all three courses, and it'll be, you'll be in and out in 30 minutes. Oh, and by the way, we can do it for instead of $50, we've got a $25 um, blue plate special. And uh, yeah. I, I'm not Chris, and I, I don't do data, and I am not that knowledgeable, but I, as a consumer, I look at it this way. These third-party delivery apps that you're talking about, they're, the current feeds, they screw up a lot. Yeah. Okay? So if you as a restaurateur continue that hospitality and continue to be consistent, I look at me as a personal, you know, when I'm, I'm ordering, I'm, I want to be lazy, I, I want to order. Half the time, my order is wrong. Something is missing. And it's not the driver's fault, it's the restaurant's fault, it, it's the bag or, or whatever. So we've got to the point where we're like, we don't want to order that anymore. We're going to drive to our favorite restaurant because we know that I'm going to get my entire order and it's going to be cooked right and it's going to be good. Even though it's, you know, a little extra drive, actually 15 minutes, I have to put, you know, I have to put pants on my five-year-old to go get it. Uh, it's still, that can that consistent body is still something we want. So as long as you can set yourself apart in that way, I think you'll, yeah, you're going to battle those third-party we, delivery apps. We were a fine dining restaurant, while you're getting the mic, we were a fine dining restaurant in the Cape. Uh, it was a small place, 48 seats. I took four nights off and people complained because I was the major D. You know, and, that you weren't in the restaurant. I was part of the experience package. Um, but you can replace that major D, but the reason we used to have major D's in full service restaurants is because they knew the customers, you know? Yeah, I was just gonna say, the funny thing is, is even in regards to some of the major brands, I'm sure anybody right here could say, for example, they have their preferred Starbucks over a different Starbucks because I'll tell you right now there's like yeah. ones I go to this one I never go to that one every time I go to that one yeah. the person at the desk is rude it takes forever it's whatever so it's funny because it's even in a uh, franchise or, or larger group you'll still have your specific restaurants that people prefer in those specific flagship stores that do much higher volume due to those factors it's not like when you're on a, a highway and you have limited selection yeah. and that is what it is but when you're in Boston, there's so many five don Dunkin' Donuts within a what? you know three blocks, <laughs> and, and you, I'm sure you have your preferred one. Here's a good example of how how someone doesn't listen to their customers. About uh, maybe five six years ago, there was a really famous chef-driven restaurant out in Newton, and so my wife and I went to to eat dinner there. We had a great dinner. He made a fabulous bolognese. And he came out and talked to us, and we were saying, how's things going? And he said, he brought it up. He said, I'm actually kind of angry. He said, I've got my bar customers, I've got my restaurant customers. Everybody that comes to the bar orders a cheeseburger. He says, I've got a really great cheeseburger. I don't want them to eat cheeseburgers. I want them to eat my Italian food. So I'm dropping it from the menu. And, I, and my wife and I looked at each other and said, what's wrong with this picture? The most favorite item on your menu is something your customers come in to get from your place and because you're pissed that they're not ordering something that's, you know, it's not even the price, it's that, it, it, that it's not your menu item, but you're selling it and you're gonna drop it and piss them off? Well, guess what happened to it? They closed. Well, that's the old school chef but, thought process. But but it's you not. eat my food the way I cook it and there's that which we need to go yeah. away from. Yeah, uh, down in, in Quincy Market, uh, Ames Plow, Back in the you know, late 70s, Ames Plow decided to serve lunch. They had a lobster salad roll for $5. And they'd make up about 100 of them every morning, sell them. And then one day they decided to stop. And they said, you know, why? You get the, everybody came in and had, you know, I used to see the Celtics guys go in there and have lunch. Um, they would, it just took too, too long. Just don't want to do it anymore. So what happened? There's no daytime business, you know. It's not just, I, it's my food, it's not listening to your customer. Not giving them the experience they, they are telling you they want. And they will tell you by what, how they order. Collect the data. Data doesn't just have to be digital. Data can be as simple as, what would you like? I, I had a, a, a group of uh, local customers that we convened as our uh, unofficial board of advisors. 
get them. They, you know, we knew who our Stadia's customers were. Come on in and tell us what's, what we're doing right. What would you like to see? We had one woman, we had served a rack of lamb uh, in the oven one time. And then we dropped it because it really wasn't a good value for us and nobody was ordering. But she was one of our best customers. She came in sometimes five times a week. She'd come in, she'd sit down, she'd order the rack of lamb salad. Two lamb chops on a, on a Caesar salad. We didn't have it on the menu. Do you think we were, anybody was ever going to tell her that we didn't have that? So what do we wind up doing? We carry rack of lamb for her because she was worth it as a customer. She more than made up the fact that we only had lamb for her. We didn't tell anybody else about it. Customize it. Tell me what the customer is. And it doesn't have to be at the fanciest time. It's the same thing at a diner. Tell me what it is. We'll give it to you. All right, Chris, yeah. I apologize to cut you off. We're actually it's over your well, and that's what you should. <laughs> Go home. Have a great life. Go make lots of I money. I mean, Chris, I don't want to, you're so knowledgeable. I don't want, I don't want to that's cut okay. you off. But did you make a plug for your book yet? Yeah, I started that. Okay, okay yeah. I, I'm going to make sure you make a plug for your book. Uh, he's got a book coming out in the next, what, week? Yeah, it's Next week on Amazon. On Amazon uh, you should check it out. You should buy it. It's awesome. He's awesome. He's very knowledgeable. He'll hang around here to answer any questions that you guys have. But thank you so much for coming. And thank you for coming to the New England Food Show. We hope to see you back next and, year. Yeah, thank you for coming on the last day of the last lecture. You should go home and make real money.